Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Biomarkers in Breast Cancer, Current Practice, Opportunities, and Unmet Needs. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Jeffrey Peppercorn. Dr. Peppercorn is a medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer who conducts research related to health policy, bioethics, and cancer survivorship. He serves as the director of the MGH Can Cancer Center Supportive Care and Survivorship Program and is the Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. If any questions arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following the presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeffrey Peppercorn. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Jen, for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you all today uh, virtually about biomarkers in breast cancer. I'll be covering current practice, uh, opportunities, and unmet needs. This program is provided, the uh, support for this program is provided by Abbott. Information is based on my interpretation, the evidence, and my clinical experience as a breast cancer medical oncologist. So um, we'll go over today uh, management of early stage breast cancer and the role of biomarkers, um, what I call defining the holy grail of the perfect biomarker that we don't really have yet, um, survivorship care uh, after early stage breast cancer and the role of tumor markers, current practice and guidelines and screening for recurrence, uh, as well as a little bit about circulating tumor DNA, which is a hot new area. We'll cover biomarkers and their use in metastatic breast cancer, current practice and needs, and then uh, summary and some of the uh, needs for future research in this area. So the holy grail, what do I mean by this? Well, as some of you may know, 94% of breast cancer is curable. So most patients come to us with cancer in their breast or their axilla, and there's at least a potential for cure. Now, unfortunately, 6% of patients have distant disease at diagnosis, stage four disease, it's treatable, but it's not curable. But this first graphic here shows the, the, the patients in yellow, that's, that's representing 94% uh, of people who are potentially curable. And we know that with appropriate therapy, 80% will be cured, but we don't know who they are. And importantly, we don't know who are the ones who actually have microscopic disease who need our interventions to get that chance of cure. So if you look at the next group there, the group that are truly at risk for reoccurrence is not the whole crowd of, of yellow patients. Those people in green represent the roughly 40% uh, that are at risk. And if we had a biomarker to identify those, we could leave the other 60% alone after their surgery. But we don't have that, so we treat everybody. And then we know that we're gonna cure about half the patients who are at risk. So again, we don't know who they are. And unfortunately, all of our patients experience fear of recurrence, and we worry about them as well. Um, and if we had a biomarker who could identify who these people were, say a blood test that would tell us, you know, you're cancer free, don't worry about it, you're still at risk, we need to intervene and give you the best chance of cure, this is what we're looking for. This is what I would call the holy grail. But as you'll see, uh, we're not quite there yet. So um, just showing the groups here. So where, what are we doing with biomarkers? Well, biomarkers are critical to define breast cancer subtypes. So this is some work from uh, Sorley and Chuck Peru published back in 2003, where they looked at gene expression. And by looking at the genes that are overexpressed and underexpressed, they were able to characterize molecular subtypes of breast cancer. And they, they showed us at least five major subtypes, luminal A's, luminal B's, HER2 positives, so-called basal-likes, and normal-likes. And probably, if we get more refined in this, there's more biologically important subtypes that we can identify right now in the lab and with genes that we can target for intervention. But where are we in the clinic? We really are only using immunohistochemistry primarily to identify three distinct breast cancer subtypes. So these are, we look at the estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, and HER2. And if they're estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor positive, called endocrine receptor positive, that is one subtype, tends to have a relatively better prognosis, sometimes doesn't need chemotherapy, the kind that uh, can recur even 10, 20, 30 years later. That's certainly better than recurring in the first two or three years. Then we've got the HER2 subtype that I'll talk a little more about. Um, 
which has a, a uh, more aggressive uh, biology and a worse prognosis unless you use special drugs directed at HER2 therapy, in which case the prognosis is now quite good. And the third is the triple negative subtype, also sometimes referred to as basal-like, but all of those that we're calling triple negative are not really the basal-like at the molecular level. Um, so we're checking these three subtypes, and I put on here the two references to the, um, the ASCO-CAP guidelines to reflect the fact that even today with these three subtypes, we're still constantly questioning how do we really define this breast cancer and what this, what this patient has. So we had new updates on how to identify estrogen and progesterone receptors correctly and how to characterize patients correctly in just 2020. We had new updates on how to define HER2 in 2018, and it's a constantly moving target. So I'm gonna retreat a little bit to just basic definitions of biomarkers to tell you what we're looking for. Um, first, there's prognostic biomarkers and there's predictive biomarkers. And in, in common English, these words basically mean the same thing. But when we're talking about biomarkers for prognostic, we mean, can this be used to understand the chance of a disease outcome, such as relapse or survival? Can, it, can, it, um, can we prognosticate about what'll happen? For example, you know, biomarker X suggests that this patient has a 30% greater chance of cancer relapse after surgery, or perhaps one that has a 30% greater chance of cure. For a predictive biomarker, we're talking about something that can be used to select a particular therapy. So this biomarker suggests that a patient will have a 50% chance of response to treatment with drug X, whatever that is. And as you'll see, we're, mo we're moving towards having, we've got many things that are prognostic, they're most useful to us when they're predictive about a specific therapy. When it comes to the framework for use of biomarkers, our, our guidelines committees, such as the American Society of Clinical Oncology and NCCN, look at three major things. First, the analytic validity. This is the ability to accurately measure the feature of interest, the protein, mutation, et cetera, both in the lab and in patients. Can you accurately and reliably measure the biomarker in blood samples? Is the assay sensitive and specific? And is the result reproducible? Then there's the clinical validity. This is the ability to reliably predict the outcome of interest. Can this biomarker reliably predict recurrence or worsening of metastatic breast cancer? And what is the false negative or false positive rate? And then finally, the, the, the top standard would be clinical utility, meaning I can use this biomarker to guide my management of patients, and it's proven that if I do that, it'll improve outcomes. So can it guide interventions such as continuing a treatment longer or switching to a new therapy, and if I do that and I use the biomarker, is survival or some other important disease outcome improved compared to my practice when I don't use the test? So that's clinical utility. Oops. Move us along. So biomarkers are used in breast cancer to evaluate prognosis. We, one of the jobs as a medical oncologist that we're always doing when we meet a new patient is we're trying to estimate the risk of recurrence. And we base it on individual prognostic factors. These, this lists the prognostic factors for early stage breast cancer, at least some of them. So there's lymph node status, size of the cancer, and something called lymphovascular invasion. And I think of these largely as the geography. Where was the cancer when we found it? Um, we also have things like the grade of the cancer on a scale of one to three, the hormone receptor status, estrogen and progesterone receptors, the HER2 new status, also other biomarkers such as CHI-67, which is a marker of proliferation. And as you'll hear about these multi-gene panels and patient age with, with younger women, particularly those under 35, having a worse prognosis, say, than those who are above 65. Um, you can think of these later criteria all as things related to biology. And in particular, these hormone receptors, HER2 new, CHI-67, and multi-gene panels are what we're talking about when we refer to biomarkers. So we can use biomarkers to individualize therapy. Um, so precision therapy is now talked about in oncology. It's really just been the last couple of years that we've been using that term. It's kind of a hot term. But I would argue that in breast cancer, uh, way before my time, clinicians have been using precision or personalized therapy in some ways for over 100 years. So I'm going to give you a, a brief window into the history of what I'd call the first biomarker-driven therapy in oncology. Back in 1895, a surgeon George Beetson, uh, he didn't know anything about estrogen at the time, but he figured out there was some hormone in the body such that he could remove the ovaries from premenopausal women and metastatic breast cancer and other parts of the body would regress. So that's been published and well-documented now for 125 years. Um, in the 20s, uh, estrogen, the hormone, was discovered and purified. And 
decades later at the University of Chicago, Dr. Jensen um, identified and purified the estrogen receptor. And so ever since then, we've been able to test for that. Oops. Um, in 1971 is when we first identified solidly the estrogen receptor as a prognostic factor in breast cancer. There's a lot of papers. It's a little hard to pinpoint the exact date of this. But around then is when you start to see papers saying, you know, people who uh, overexpress breast cancer do better than people who don't express breast cancer, uh, sorry, who uh, overexpress the estrogen receptor do better than those who don't express the estrogen receptor. Then, ever since 1977, we've had my friend tamoxifen, a drug that we still use in clinic today. It's a non-steroidal anti-estrogen drug, now called a selective estrogen receptor modulator, or CIRM. And it was approved back then by the FDA for treatment of advanced breast cancer, meaning breast cancer that spread to other parts of the body. Um, it was then shown uh, to be useful as an adjunct of therapy for our patients with early stage disease, potentially curable, back in 1985. Um, and uh, it was proven, it, it, we identified in 1998 that it was best for ER positive breast cancer. It was still considered experimental for ER negative or poor breast cancer. And really, it wasn't until this was sort of very early in my career, until 2005, for a drug we've had since 1977, that we realized that ER was a very important biomarker and that you should really only use tamoxifen in patients who are ER positive, not in those who are uh, ER or estrogen receptor negative. Um, so it took a long time to get where we are today. And as I told you, we're still defining as of 2020, who's really estrogen receptor positive and what should the threshold be and how should we do the testing for that biomarker? So it is complicated. But estrogen and progesterone receptors are both biomarkers and both of them relate to the endocrine sensitivity of a tumor and the drugs we should use. They can inform prognosis. You get improved prognosis with increased expression. They can predict response to therapy for early stage breast cancer, and they can predict response to therapy for advanced breast cancer. So just, to, I'm not gonna go in great detail into the treatment of breast cancer, but again, just to show you how uh, these, these biomarkers are used for a postmenopausal woman uh, who's estrogen receptor positive, HER2 negative, we use a estrogen lowering drug, an aromatase inhibitor for anywhere from five to 10 years. For uh, premenopausal women, we will tend to use tamoxifen alone, or we'll use that plus ovarian suppression, or sometimes an aromatase inhibitor plus ovarian suppression for five to 10 years. And this has been shown to reduce the risk of recurrence um, compared to surgery alone by an additional 30 to 50%. So quite a powerful intervention. For metastatic or advanced breast cancer, we tend to treat uh, premenopausal patients, all of them get ovarian suppression, and then patients, whether they're younger or older, will get an aromatase inhibitor, we're now adding new drugs on top of that um, to block me mechanisms of endocrine resistance with the CDK4-6 inhibitors. We're using a drug called fulvestrant, which is a selective estrogen receptor degrader. And we tend to use multiple lines of endocrine therapy for as long as they keep working. And eventually we need to move on to chemotherapy and the biomarker becomes less important. But median survival uh, for metastatic ER positive breast cancer is now about five years and many patients will do well for 10 years or longer. Um, this is just, sorry, this is just a slide um, showing you the benefits of tamoxifen compared to control uh, published many years ago. There's about a 33% reduction in the risk of recurrence overall and a 25% reduction in breast cancer risk from tamoxifen. And since then, we've played with extending the duration. There's additional benefits you can eke out by adding ovarian suppression or extending it from five to 10 years in select patients. So what about other biomarkers? Well, this is what I would call sort of, that was the, if that was the first biomarker, I would say this is maybe the example of an optimal biomarker to guide precision cancer therapy. Um, so I'll again, walk you through the history, if I can get my slides to work. Um, so back in 1987, this doesn't go quite as ancient as the other one, but Dennis Slayman at UCLA recognized that the reason some women with breast cancer did worse than others, even though the size was the same and the stage was the same, with that they overexpressed this HER2 protein or, the, or they um, had amplification of the HER2 gene. So it's a, a negative prognostic factor known in the 80s. Then uh, he and his lab helped develop a monoclonal antibody, trastuzumab, against the HER2 protein. Um, back in 96, it took some time to develop it, but there were single arm studies showing that uh, this drug was effective. And then we had randomized controlled trials published in 2001 showing that there was improved survival, five months improved survival, uh, by adding the drug trastuzumab 
compared to chemotherapy alone. So for a, for a disease where survival was about two years, extending it by an additional almost half a year was a, a meaningful result, uh, resulting in this drug getting approved back in 98. And then the biggest impact, I would argue, was when we did studies showing that this could reduce the, the risk of even getting metastatic disease in the first place for people with early stage HER2 positive breast cancer with a 50% reduction in risk. Um, it was approved in 2006 for node positive breast cancer and in 2008 for uh, node negative breast cancer. So even for our lowest risk patients with HER2 positive disease, we are now using this. Um, so it is a biomarker that informs our prognosis. You do, uh, unless you get special treatment, you do worse if you have this. Um, it predicts response to HER2 targeted therapy such that prognosis is now, I would argue, quite good. And we now, amazingly, have seven approved drugs. I remember this thing was just identified back in 87, the first drug approved in 98. Today, we have seven approved drugs, two monoclonal antibodies, three small molecule inhibitors, and some novel drug antibody conjugates. The, um, the graph there, which hopefully uh, you can see clearly, just shows the difference between chemotherapy alone, the best chemotherapy we had circa 2005, where for these patients with lymph node positive, HER2 positive disease, the cure rate was about 65%. And then you added this single drug, a monoclonal antibody, suddenly the cure rate is up above 85%. So that's, that's what we're looking for in precision therapy throughout oncology, biomarker-driven therapy with a highly effective drug. And, and the, the prognosis has only gotten better as we've been able to add to that. So unmet needs, what about triple negative breast cancer? so-called because it's negative for estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2. Essentially, doesn't have a biomarker. There's no there's other things that we're starting to use in advanced disease, but in early stage disease, there's really nothing else that we're using in clinic. And, um, and we, know, we know that we're not doing well enough here. Um, the science, which is not yet translated to the clinic, shows us that we're clearly looking at more than one disease currently grouped as triple negative, um, some studies have shown that about 80% are truly basal-like based on molecular phenotype, 15% uh, are normal-like, there's some luminal Bs, there's some luminal As, there's even a small amount of HER2 uh, breast cancer uh, subtypes in there. And there's a whole bunch of potential biomarkers. We just haven't established their, um, their clinical utility yet to bring them into the clinic. So some of the things that are, that are being looked at are upregulation of RAS and MEK, PI3 kinase mutations, Androgen receptor expression, and there's already drugs to target the androgen receptor in triple negative disease and some impressive outcomes in um, early phase trials. And then uh, somatic BRC, BRCA mutations, where we, again, have approved drugs to treat patients with advanced disease, but we're just starting to use them in studies in early phase disease, not to mention immunotherapy and questions about who should benefit. Um, so biomarkers can also be used to guide decisions over chemotherapy. Uh, particularly for patients with ER-positive lymph node-negative breast cancer. So I'm going to bring you into the clinic for a minute and talk about a case, a 55-year-old woman with early-stage breast cancer who has just had a lumpectomy. Her cancer is 1.8 centimeters. Um, she's got two negative sentinel nodes, intermediate grade. Uh, it's estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive, HER2 negative. So we're clearly going to give her endocrine therapy. That's, that's established. And the question is, should she do chemotherapy? So as of 2005, around the time that I started practice, the calculus would be, would be that, you know, this patient has about a 20% risk of recurrence over the next 10 years with surgery and radiation alone. We could cut this down with endocrine therapy to about 10 to 12%, and chemotherapy might offer an additional 4 to 5% reduction in risk. Is it worth it? And you can imagine that having a discussion about are you going to undergo chemotherapy for anywhere from a 4 to 5% or maybe a 3% reduction would, would take an hour and there was no right answer. And, and patients were looking to us for guidance and really it's, it's a very difficult decision. Um, so it wasn't a very satisfying discussion, but we had to do it and we had to treat people. Um, so now there was a clear unmet need and as a, a biomarker, people came up with not one single marker, but sort of a multi-gene panel, a multi-gene prognostic assay. And a number of different investigators and companies did this. So today we've got Oncotype DX, Mammal, Print, Prosigna, Endopredict, Breast Cancer Index, and others. Um, and all of them do similar things, evaluating some panel, anywhere from 70 to 21 genes, that, can, that are proven to predict prognosis among patients with early-stage ER-positive breast cancer who are treated with endocrine therapy alone. 
and, and they can help us identify patients who remain at high risk despite endocrine therapy who need chemotherapy. So this is a great, um, this is one of my favorite graphs published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology back in 2006 that kind of explains the power of this tool. This is using the Oncotype test. So in panel A, you see all patients in a clinical trial where the patients were treated either with tamoxifen or tamoxifen plus chemotherapy. And overall, there was this three to 5% benefit. It was statistically significant. And that's what led to these very difficult, you know, so it's real, but it's tiny. And that led to these very difficult discussions with our patients. Uh, but if you stratify them based on this biomarker, you find a group that's got has a low risk uh, oncotype recurrence score. And those patients are gonna do well no matter what you do. Um, they do equally well with or without chemotherapy. And, and you really, that whole conversation would have been pointless and misleading in some cases. So that's about 50% of all patients, and we're glad we're not treating them with chemotherapy. Then there's this middle group, intermediate risk patients, um, according to the recurrence score, who do a little bit worse, and it's actually unclear. I mean, if you look at the graph, you'd say it's not unclear. There's really no difference. But there wasn't statistical power to say whether chemotherapy helped them a lot. So hold that point. That, that group was uncertain. That's about 25% of patients. And then there was this 25% group that were at high risk, whereas you can see there's a large split in prognosis. If you do tamoxifen alone, there's almost a, uh, only a 60% chance of cure, and you can boost that up again above 90% if you give them chemotherapy. And certainly, you'd want to identify those patients and give them chemotherapy. So I like this because it shows the power of that biomarker. Um, then there was a randomized trial published recently called the Taylor X study, over 10,000 patients, trying to help address, among other things, the question of what do we do with that intermediate group? So one thing this trial did was for the low-risk patients, it showed us, yes, very reassuringly in a prognostic fashion, they do great, they don't need chemo. The score is 11 or under. But for people who are estrogen receptor positive and node negative, if their score was 11 to 25, almost 7,000 patients were randomly assigned to chemotherapy or no chemotherapy. All of them got endocrine therapy. And what we saw was that there was no difference with chemotherapy at nine years. Um, there was basically an 83% chance of remaining recurrence-free, whether you did chemotherapy or not, 92% uh, chance of not having it go to distant places of the body, so those recurrences were mostly in the breast or the axilla, and a 94% chance you'd be alive at nine years, regardless of doing chemotherapy. Now, uh, one caveat, there was some benefit in people at the higher end of this middle range if they were premenopausal or under 50. We think some of that, at least, is, is not the benefit from chemo killing dividing cells, but from chemo shutting down the ovaries and, and basically boosting the strength of endocrine therapy in these patients, which may be why you see a difference in patients who still have ovarian function, those under 50, and those who are versus those who are postmenopausal, where chemo didn't add anything. So that's that's where we are with early stage breast cancer. Um, questions that are still unanswered are: uh, What about the best biomarker to use for for uh, selecting chemotherapy for patients with node positive breast cancer. Mammoprint has been used and has some uh, prospective data to help us, but in general, we still need better markers for this highest risk group, um, not to mention which chemotherapies to use. Uh, selection of optimal endocrine therapy. We'd love to know when we can get away with tamoxifen alone, when, we, when patients do better off with an aromatase inhibitor in our premenopausal women. And also, since we've now got studies showing that there's a benefit from up to 10 years or longer, um, we'd like to know which patients, since these, these medicines have side effects, which patients really can get away with less than, you know, five years or less than five years. Um, they just don't need it. Which patients need five, which patients need 10, which patients need more than 10. Um, and then the role of immunotherapy for high-risk triple negative breast cancer, since those patients um, have a very concerning prognosis if it comes back. And we've seen some hints that immunotherapy can be useful. We'd really like to better understand who to use it in. There's some now good data for neoadjuvant therapy. There's many trials ongoing in this space, but with these trials, we're collecting blood samples and looking at the tumor to try to figure out biomarkers to help guide the use of immunotherapy and other targeted therapies. So biomarkers can also be used selectively to evaluate symptoms in breast cancer survivors. So as you heard at the beginning, I'm a breast cancer doc and one of my jobs is running the survivorship program. And I can tell you that most patients with breast cancer do survive. 
And there's a lot of things we worry about in the ongoing care of these patients. Their mental health, emotional health, chronic symptoms they may have, late effects of therapy such as cardiac toxicity, wellness and lifestyle issues, are they fit, are they eating well, social and practical issues, and a big one is screening for cancer recurrence. I will tell you that 80 to 90% of patients are cured, but 100% worry about the risk of recurrence, understandably, as I think all of us would. Um, and the question is, what can and should we do about that? This is a very frequent topic uh, of conversation in clinic. You know, are we gonna get scans? Are there blood tests? What can we do? Um, so tumor markers are very appealing. These are substances, typically proteins, detected in blood that may be able to indicate the presence or growth of a cancer. So an ideal tumor marker, um, which I will, uh, I will give you the punchline, we do not have yet, but an ideal tumor marker would only be found when the cancer is there and you'd be able to perfectly distinguish patients with cancer from those without. So if I check this lab and you don't have this marker, you're home free, that's it. Um, you, can, you don't even need to maybe come back to the oncology clinic. Um, on the other hand, if you have it, what it means can vary. Is it gonna come back in two years? Is it gonna come back in 10 years? But we'd wanna know that, we'd wanna address it and maybe monitor differently. Um, ideally, the level of elevation of the marker, how high it is, might tell us how to guide screening for cancer in the first place. Um, what the cancer burden is and what intensity of therapy to use. It might demonstrate therapeutic success. In other words, the marker's high, I give radiation or I give chemotherapy, it goes down or it goes to zero, I know I've been successful. And as I said, it can be used to screen for occurrence. So there are some effective and clinically um, useful biomarkers in oncology. We just really don't have any in breast cancer yet. So think of PSA for prostate cancer, use of the M protein for myeloma, um, HCG and some testicular cancers. And in fact, one that we are looking at in breast cancer, CEA, is actually used, um, and it's in the guidelines for colon cancer. So this, um, this biomarker was identified in 1965. There were studies then of colon cancers that found that virtually all cancer cells seemed to express CEA and the healthy tissue did not. So that was, you know, as I said, a perfect biomarker. Now, as it's turned out over time, this is not entirely true with our modern assays, but it's still a very good marker, particularly for colon cancer. And elevated levels can be found in other cancer types. So certainly other cancers of the GI tract, um, breast cancer, medullary thyroid carcinoma, liver, lung, ovarian, pancreatic, and prostate cancers. Um, whoops, my slide jumped, sorry. Um, as I said, it's a proven marker in colon cancer management, elevation after surgery, um, predicts recurrence. Um, but it's also associated with non-cancer medical issues, kidney disease, hypothyroid, lung disease, liver disease, uh, even cigarette smoking, and it can be elevated even in 3% of people who don't seem to have any condition. Um, so it is not perfect. Um, it does seem to be involved in inflammation. It does have some cancer-specific functions, um, but it, it doesn't perfectly distinguish, as I said. Um, we also have other biomarkers that we're looking at in breast cancer, CA15-3 and CA27-23. These are basically both measures of the MUC1 protein and the numbers and the different assays, um, you know, different centers I've worked at have tended to use one versus the other, but this just refers to the antibodies that are used in the assay to find MUC1. Um, MUC1 is a uh, transmembrane, transmembrane glycoprotein that is altered and overexpressed in multiple cancer types, and it plays a role in progression of disease, um, cancer survival and resistance to chemotherapy. It can be elevated in breast cancer but also in ovarian, uterine, lung, colon, and other cancer types. Um, and it can be elevated in people with benign breast disease, benign ovarian cysts, liver disease, and up to 5% of healthy people. So again, if you find it very elevated, it could mean that there's cancer there, and it's certainly concerning. But especially if it's slightly elevated, it could be many other things, and it's not a perfect screening tool. Um, is it prognostic? Yes, there's many studies like this one from um, 2015. They looked at 432 patients with early stage breast cancer, they measured it before surgery, and then every six to 12 months. And if you could, as you can see, prognosis was, was uh, somewhat worse if one of them was elevated and significantly worse if both uh, were elevated. Um, however, close to 40% who, who had elevated levels still had not recurred 10 years later. So you wouldn't really wanna use this in clinic, find it's elevated and be scaring 40% of people who are gonna be fine 10 years later. That is the challenge in an asymptomatic patient.
So there's been a lot of studies now um, looking at more intensive screening in patients and cancer survivors, um, constantly asking the question, can't we do more than just, you know, wait for the cancer to come back um, or wait for symptoms to show up? Well, the answer is uh, unfortunately uh, not clear, and there's not much more that we know we can do so far. So the first trial, the Givio trial, was in Italy, um, over 1,000 patients, and they compared more intensive screening, which in that trial was defined as liver function tests, blood tests, plus a chest X-ray versus clinical visits alone, and it made no difference in survival or the quality of life uh, at six-year follow-up. Another study done around the same time in Italy, I'm not sure what was going on in Italy with these investigators at that time, but another study looked at over 1,000 patients, and they compared um, more intensive imaging studies, chest X-ray, and a bone scan um, uh, versus clinic visits alone, and again, saw no difference in survival at either five or 10 years. Um, so we don't get imaging studies if people don't have symptoms. Um, there haven't been a lot of studies of tumor markers, but one of the best ones was a nearly 500-person randomized trial where patients either had a routine clinical visit or clinical visit plus tumor markers, liver function tests, and chest X-ray um, every six months, and then scans, whether they had symptoms or not, every two years. Again, there was no difference in survival, at least at the four-year mark. So um, what are the guidelines? These are from 1996, you'll notice, but they still apply today. CEA and CA15-3 are not sensitive enough to detect all micrometastatic disease, so this is not the holy grail. Um, that's why the uh, Frenchman in the corner is taunting us, as he did in the movie The Holy Grail, um, for those who appreciate that. Um, they can be elevated in healthy people without metastatic disease. They might be elevated years before disease shows up, so it's unclear if identifying that helps in any way. 30% um, of people with known metastatic disease do not have elevation, so it was recommended in those guidelines to not check people without symptoms. Um, this, was this has been addressed multiple times in the Choosing Wisely campaign, trying to inform us all how we can save money without adversely affecting pan uh, cancer care. One of the things that was recommended was not to perform surveillance testing like biomarkers or imaging for asymptomatic patients who've been treated with breast cancer with curative intent. Uh, some limits in this data, however, there's clear evidence that tumor markers can detect recurrence early. So, their utility is not, their lack of utility is uh, somewhat suspect. Many new drugs since 2005 have been developed when those most recent large randomized controlled trials of intensive surveillance were done. So is it possible that if you found disease earlier now, even though it was asymptomatic, and you use some of our new drugs, that you might make a difference in outcomes? We actually don't know. Um, and certainly, one of the things that concerns me most as an oncologist is that there might be differences in the utility for people who are at higher risk, either on the basis of their clinical stage or their biology. You know, this, these studies of 1,000 patients, if you included vast majority of patients who are lower risk or ER positive, then they're not going to recur no matter what you do, and you might be swamping the benefits of early or intensive staging in those with higher risk disease. But, but screening can lead to harm. There can be false positive results. Um, additional tests uh, and biopsies uh, may be done, and uh, we need evidence that this kind of thing will help before considering patients without symptoms. So I'd say this should be done in a clinical trial, not in routine practice. So what do I do with this data and the limitations in the current data in my practice for early stage breast cancer? Well, here's an example. The case is a 50-year-old woman with a history of left-sided invasive lobular breast cancer. It's three centimeters involving two lymph nodes. Um, it's estrogen receptor positive, HER2 negative, uh, she had a lumpectomy, chemotherapy, and radiation. She's now on endocrine therapy with an aromatase inhibitor for three years. And she comes into me reporting two months of abdominal pain. She's seen in her local emergency department, and the CT scan of her uh, abdomen doesn't show any clear evidence of metastatic disease. So what do we do? She does have a few small liver and lung nodules, too small to characterize, and you know, which is un not uncommon, and she still feels unwell. So I would do an exam. I would repeat, I'm planning to repeat imaging because we have to do that <clears throat> in three to six months. And I would check tumor markers. And if they're normal, that's very, that's very reassuring, although it doesn't really change the need for uh, follow-up. I'd still get those scans to be sure she's okay, but I would, I would assume actually that it's probably not cancer recurrence. Now, if they're markedly elevated, which is the main reason I would be getting the test, 
I would be very worried for recurrence. I would clearly follow her differently, get further imaging at that time, uh, follow her more closely. If, if her symptoms persist, I might even consider surgical exploration. Um, and we might, if they keep going up, we might change endocrine therapy and see if there's a response. Um, now, the problem comes if they're slightly abnormal. This would probably still lead to closer follow-up, but it may not, as I've suggested, indicate cancer recurrence, and it could lead to increased anxiety. Um, so that's where you run some risk. And usually, if I'm going to order tumor markers for patients with symptoms, um, which, again, is a choice um, not addressed in those guidelines, I discuss these three possible results with patients, and I sort of warn them that if they're slightly elevated, this may create anxiety, and it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a problem down the road. Um, and in my experience, it often doesn't mean that there's a problem down the road. Um, so uh, what's new and what's coming? Well, this is a relatively new technology, not in the clinic yet, outside of clinical trials, but ctDNA, or circulating tumor DNA, is about detecting DNA from cancer cells in a blood test. It's also called a liquid biopsy um, because we can detect the molecular features of the cancer, and it can be used to predict prognosis, theoretically, guide therapy, evaluate response to therapy, and detect recurrence of cancer in clinical studies. But we need evidence of clinical utility uh, and improvement in outcomes before we use it. So this is the kind of evidence we have right now. This was a study of 170 patients from five uh, hospitals in the UK where they looked at prospective collection of ctDNA. Patients with early stage breast cancer with, uh, had samples collected at the time of surgery, then every three months times one year, and then every six months. DNA was extracted from the biopsy, studied for mutations, followed by blood tests with PCR assays to detect that patient's specific somatic mutations as a possible sign of recurrence. So first, it, it, um, they looked at people at baseline among 80 patients. They found that they could detect ctDNA in 51% of people at diagnosis, and actually that was prognostic. It did, um, it did identify patients at a higher risk of relapse over the next five years. Even more compelling when you follow people over time and look for their specific mutation in their tumor to pop up again in the blood test, this happened in 16% of patients in this study. And in those patients, as you can see from this graph, there was a big difference in prognosis. If it never came up, if you had a specific mutation and they couldn't find it in the blood, your prognosis over the uh, six years in this study was excellent, very few recurrences. But if you were in the other group uh, who was ctDNA positive by... Um, by five years, you know, roughly uh, all but 30% had recurred. So that is a um, potentially very important tool. You can imagine then that at the time that you first detected the ctDNA, you would love to put these people in a clinical trial or start an intervention and see if that can make a difference. So that's the next step. So as the investigators here said, our results demonstrate clinical validity for ctDNA mutation tracking with PCR, but they do not demonstrate clinical utility. Without evidence that mutation tracking can improve patient outcomes, our results should not be recommended yet for routine clinical practice. So that's where we are. So I'm going to turn now and talk about, take a sip of water, and then talk about biomarkers being used to guide therapy in metastatic breast cancer. So metastatic breast cancer is incurable, uh, but has a highly variable prognosis. So uh, for most of my career, uh, at least till recent years, Median survival was only about two years, but even then, there were rare patients who were survived 10 years, 20 years later. I've seen people in my clinic who didn't start with me, but they were given bad news 20 years ago, and they're still doing okay. Um, so highly variable. And now, the average is closer to five years after diagnosis of metastatic disease for people with ER-positive disease and with HER2-positive disease with modern therapy. Unfortunately, for people with triple negative breast cancer, it's still really in the one to two year range and, and closer to one, and there's some very aggressive cancers um, that, are, that are concerning um, that we need better biomarkers and better treatments for. So we treat metastatic cancer based on subtype, based on these biomarkers. If they're ER positive, we use serial lines of endocrine therapy until they're resistant, and then we move to chemotherapy. And now we're using some other therapies, um, not with clear, all with clear biomarkers, but CDK4-6, mTOR, and as you'll hear about, PI3 kinase inhibitors, which do have a biomarker. For HER2-positive disease, we're using HER2-targeted therapy, usually, although not always, with a chemo backbone. And now we've got multiple new drugs, and we're starting to explore use of therapy in HER2-low patients with that as a biomarker. And in triple-negative metastatic breast cancer, we're predominantly using chemotherapy, but 
Now in first line setting, we're using immunotherapy as a standard option for people who are PDL1 positive, and we're using PARP inhibitors for triple negative or any breast cancer that's BRCA1 or 2 positive. So the 2015 ASCO guidelines say that at the diagnosis of metastatic disease, we should do a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis, check our standard clinical biomarkers, ER, PR, and HER2, to guide therapy. They highlight the fact that the estrogen receptor status can actually change up to 10% of the time between the initial tumor and the metastatic disease, which can come years later. Progesterone receptor can change even more often, and HER2, which is so important to guide therapy, can change up to 6% of the time. This could be due to the assay sometimes, so that's a concern, but it's also been documented to happen due to mutation or tumor heterogeneity where, where one clone uh, survives and recurs. Therapy is guided by biomarker status of the metastatic disease, not the original tumor. And as of 2015, uh, in these guidelines, there was no additional biomarkers that were deemed useful to select therapy. Um, not CHI-67, P53. They did not recommend using the next genera generation sequencing or molecular profiling panels, which I would argue are now standard five years later. Um, and they did not consider new data on BRCA, PI3 kinase, and ESR1 that, is, that has really emerged primarily since that time. Um, so that's fair. Um, I'm going to talk about some of these biomarkers. I'm actually not going to go into BRCA, which is its own interesting story, but suffice it to say that PARP inhibitors are now improved for people who have BRCA mutations as one biomarker. And this is another interesting one, <clears throat> the PI3 kinase mutation. This is a lipid kinase, part of the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR cell signaling pathway. Uh, having a mutation of PI3 kinase conveys worse prognosis, prognosis in metastatic breast cancer and resistance to endocrine therapy and it's found in about 40% of all ER-positive, HER2-negative metastatic breast cancers. So it's uh, prognostic. Now, what about predicting, val predicting uh, value of using a specific drug? So there have been lots of PI3 kinase drugs uh, in clinical trials in breast cancer over the years, but the first one approved is Alpalisa. So the SOLAR-1 trial took over 500 patients and randomly assigned, those, uh, assigned them to fulvestrant, an estrogen receptor degrader, endocrine therapy, plus or minus this PI3 kinase inhibitor. And uh, if you did not have a PI3 kinase mutation, as shown in the bottom here, there was no difference. So the biomarker is critically important. But if you have the PI3 kinase mutation, there was a over four month difference in progression-free survival, uh, close to six months versus 11 months. And clinical benefit, the chance that at six months, you're gonna have either responsive disease or at least stable disease, went up from 45% to 62%. So certainly if I'm a patient, that's very clinically meaningful. Um, it was FDA approved in 2019. So we have it in the clinic now. But actually, although we are trying to uh, do this routinely, testing for PI3 kinase uh, mutations is not quite automated. It's not just as a doctor, every time I send a pathology sample, I get this result back. So it just shows you where we are. I mean, we can get it, we just have to order it. Um, but it's not quite where we are for ER, PR, HER2. So our pathologists, for pathologists in the audience, you know, you would never read out a breast cancer case and not tell them the estrogen receptors. Um, but at least at some institutions, we're not yet getting routine PI3 kinase testing. And when there's a drug and you're going to use that mutation to guide therapy, it's important to know this. Um, but it's a rapidly evolving field, as I said. Um, similarly, uh, the PDL1 programmed uh, cell death ligand is a cell surface protein that inhibits the immune response to cancer. Um, it's expressed in up to 40% of patients with triple negative breast cancer or in triple negative breast cancers, I should say. And expression in this case correlates with improved outcomes. So you can think of it maybe that um, uh, if it's overexpressed, maybe it's because the immune system is attacking the cancer and it's trying to block that. So there's drugs to target this and try to let the immune system attack the cancer more effectively. There's, you know, everybody I think in the audience probably knows the story of immunotherapy throughout oncology. But in breast cancer, the first drug approved is atezolizumab. This is from a randomized trial of 900 patients who got either regular chemotherapy with NAB, NAB paclitaxel uh, or NAB paclitaxel plus the immunotherapy with the tezolizumab. Overall, there was a modest two-month uh, difference in survival, you know, about 19 versus 21 months, not that impressive. But if you used the biomarker and you said, what about people who had more than 1% pdl one expression, you saw a seven-month difference in survival. So, you know, I'm only going to survive 18 months, or if I take this drug first line, 
I'm going to survive 25 months. Now, again, certainly not good enough, but that is a very meaningful difference. And that's why this drug was FDA approved um, in March 2019. And just as we saw earlier with trastuzumab, where it had about a five-month difference in the advanced uh, cancer setting, and it's, it's you know made a big difference there, but it was when we moved it up front that we saw a very impressive difference in the cure rate. So that's what we're hoping for this or similar drugs. That's the subject of ongoing uh, studies. So, sorry. Um, so the NCCN guidelines now in 2020 recommend the following biomarkers. Um, for any patient getting first-line disease, BRCA testing to see if they should be exposed to a PARP inhibitor as one of their treatments. Um, if they're ER positive, HER2 negative, in the second line, testing for a PI3 kinase mutation, again, seen in about 40% of ER positive, HER2 negative patients, because you would want to consider the drug alpilisib. In triple negative patients, first line, it's recommended you test for pdl one expression, as I've just been talking about. And then there's two others that they mention for select circumstances. You'll notice the prevalence of these for both of them is about one in a thousand. So I would not call this standard, but certainly may want to consider it. And it's in the guidelines for those reasons. So NTRK fusion, um, where we now have specific drugs that can be very effective. If you have that one in a thousand patients, it can make a big difference for them, although still not curable. Or if they have microsatellite high or deficient in uh, mismatch repair, again, rare, but the immunotherapy pembrolizumab has been proven to help those patients regardless of whether it's breast cancer, lung cancer, or anything else. So um, we're getting these if we send the multi-gene panels, which as I said, I think is now standard, um, but we still have to request it. It's not that if I see a patient and um, I, you know, they, they go to a biopsy, we diagnose them with metastatic disease, that this is automatically run. You have to sign specific consent for it, specifically request the test. But I think within a few years, it will be standard on all patients, uh, the way things are going. And lastly, as a breast cancer doc, I want to talk about ESR1, because if I had one other thing that I could have routinely right now, it would be this one. Um, but it's not yet on that list of recommended biomarkers. Um, this, the, the, the uh, the estrogen receptor is encoded by the ESR1 gene, which in initial breast, primary breast cancer is very rarely mutated. So it's not a big problem, although it can be, in our initial breast cancer patients. But up, upwards of 50% of our patients with metastatic disease can have alterations in ESR1 as a mechanism of acquired resistance. And when they have it, we know that these are the patients who do best with CDK4-6 inhibitors or with fulvestrant instead of an aromatase inhibitor. Um, and there's new drugs in, in clinical trials, uh, like fulvestrin, but, but presumably more powerful. Um, so these are coming along. Now, it's not yet standard in clinic, but since clinically, I do face a choice sometimes between giving a patient with metastatic disease an aromatase inhibitor versus fulvestrin, not to mention putting them on CDK4-6 inhibitor, although we usually do that in all cases, I would like to have the SR1 status, and we can get that as part of the testing that is available. So... We also uh, are thinking about biomarkers to evaluate response to therapy in metastatic breast cancer. This is just a brief review of our standard practice. We diagnose them, we determine the subtype, we evaluate for some of the select biomarkers as you've heard, and then we take our best guess, we pick a drug or regimen, we evaluate the toxicity, You know, how are they tolerating it? We see them every four to six weeks, how are they doing? And we scan them every two to three months. And we learn at those two to three or sometimes four month intervals whether the disease is getting worse or not and whether we need to switch therapy. So we've got a clear opportunity for early evaluation with a biomarker or blood test that maybe we could get at every four to six week visit that might give us a early clue about whether we need to move the scans up or if they're doing fine, maybe we can move the scans back and it could help us in a relatively non-invasive, uh, non-toxic way. Um, so there are tumor markers that we can use to evaluate response to therapy. This is from a recent study of um, just to demonstrate among uh, nearly 50 patients who had HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer undergoing their first line of treatment. And the investigators just followed um, both the CEA, CA15-3, and another biomarker that I haven't discussed called the um, serum extracellular domain of HER2, which in this particular subtype has been shown to be useful. As you see, over time, in general, for all of these patients, though varied between patients, the trend is down. So as you're giving effective therapy, and we have very effective therapies in HER2 positive disease, the biomarkers tend to go down, and that does, whoops, that does in fact correlate with response on imaging. So people who have a fantastic response, although rare, have a, a large uh, decline in their tumor markers, 
people who have a partial response tend to have the markers going down. People whose scans are stable tended to have stable um, tumor markers. And people whose cancer is worse tend to have the marker going up. So you could use these blood tests as a adjunct of an early predictor of what's going to happen. Now, the problem has been known for a long time. This is a study from 30 years ago looking at the kinetics of tumor marker response in breast cancer, looking, whoops, looking at CA and CA15-3. Um, as you can see, in the initial weeks, it tended to go up. Then it was basically stable back to baseline at week four, and only five, six, and beyond did it start to go down. So this is, you would not want to have tested at week two seen the marker going up, decided it's not working, and switched to something, because this patient ultimately responded to this treatment. Um, so these are the 1996 ASCO guidelines based on data like this, um, which, which highlight the fact that there's a good but not perfect correlation with response to therapy. You know, about 70 to 80 percent of people who are responding will have decreased tumor markers. About 75 percent of those with stable cancer will have stable tumor markers, 75 to 80 percent with progressive cancer will have increased tumor markers, but it's not perfect. And early in treatment, as I just showed you, they can rise. So they recommend actually not at least within the four weeks and being cautious if you're doing it within the first four to six weeks even, and never really relying on one value for all of these reasons. But if there's a persistent trend over time, that usually correlates with progressive disease, and you might be seeing that before you get schemes. Um, so they recommend, they, they highlight the fact that in terms of switching to a new therapy, this is always based on clinical evaluation um, of disease progression response. And there's no evidence that changing therapy solely on the basis of biomarkers improves health outcomes, quality of life, or cost effectiveness. I should highlight this is not from the 96 guidelines. This is from the 2015 guidelines. So this is basically our current guidelines we're operating under. Um, they do point out that CEA, CA15-3, and CA2729 may contribute to decisions for metastatic breast cancer. They say there's not clear, you know, from clinical trials, solid enough evidence of clinical utility, but there's, there's a lot of clinical experience and informal consensus that this can be helpful. And they say that it's also reasonable if clinicians prefer not to, for them not to use these markers. So it's a choice and you just have to know what you're getting into. What do I do? I view it as a three-legged stool and I really use this metaphor when I talk about it with patients. I'm always going kind to of think about what the patient looks like, what they're telling me, their symptoms and their exam as one evidence of are they responding or not and how are they doing. I'm going to use tumor markers, but I don't overinterpret them, and I check them over time, and I try not to pay attention to one isolated value, but if there's a clear trend, that will be meaningful to me um, in either direction. And I use scans. I put scans are probably the, you know, the most objective piece of this, but I put them all together to decide clinically what's going on and should we therapy. So what about circulating tumor cells? In fairness, I just want to comment on them because this is a technology still being used in research I think it still holds a lot of promise, but it's been a little disappointing in some of the studies to date. So these were identified in autopsy specimens of people with cancer uh, back in the 1860s. You could look on the microscope and see tumor cells. So the concept is not new, and we found ways to do a blood test and, and pull out these circulating tumor cells. And we know that they can be seen in up to 25% of people at diagnosis, and that a high level of them is not a great thing. So it's not perfect but it can predict your um, risk of recurrence. In metastatic breast cancer, um, similarly, there's good prognostic studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2004, study of 177 patients that showed if you have more five of these uh, in your 7.5 mLs of blood, this is worse uh, prognosis. For example, um, more than five showed, uh, pe people had more than five had eight months overall survival compared to 18 months in those with less than five with the treatments of that time. So <clears throat> a clinical trial was done to see if these would be you know, clinically useful in practice to guide switching of therapy. This was SWOG SO500, a randomized trial of nearly 300 patients, all of whom, all of whom had high CTCs, and they were randomized to doing an early switch uh, based on the response or staying on therapy. And unfortunately, uh, using CTCs to guide the decision to switch showed no difference in progression-free or overall survival after whoops, or after after four months. So they're still being used in research, but they're not generally being used in clinical practice. This was published in JCO back in 2014. Um, I want to make one comment on liquid biopsy versus tumor biopsy because this is a hot area. I've already alluded to this. Um, certainly, there's times we still need a tumor biopsy 
particularly when we're seeing something on a scan, we don't know what it is, and we want to make the diagnosis of metastatic disease. But there are risks to invasive biopsies. Um, now, biopsy in the breast is relatively safe, can cause pain, minor bleeding, but really almost zero risk of serious complications. When we're talking about metastatic disease in the liver, um, a study of 150 patients showed 7% have moderate pain, no major bleeds, smaller number of minor bleeds in the study. And I actually have had patients who've undergone a liver biopsy one not too long ago who unfortunately had a complication, big bleed, ended up in the hospital. She was fine out the next day, but I, I do not view this as a benign procedure. And lung biopsies are even more problematic with anywhere from 10 to 15% of pneumothorax. Again, patients are usually fine, but they might need a chest tube, they might need to be in the hospital. So these are not risk-free. Um, liquid biopsies, which basically means a blood test, are far less invasive. I mean, it's like having you know, your blood drawn. We've all had that. Um, essentially zero risk, close to zero pain. Um, liquid biopsy tells you what is happening now and can be followed for changes over time. So you, know, you might need one tumor biopsy, but you'd like to not have to stick a needle in the liver or the lungs or the bone all the time. And if you could reliably draw blood and see what molecular changes there are, that would be incredibly useful. So this is how I am generally ordering my, blood, my um, molecular evaluation of people with metastatic breast cancer from a blood test. Um, and I think this is becoming routine practice. So I've covered a lot of ground. I've almost lost my voice, as you can tell. But in summary, hitting the high points, biomarkers are critical to define breast cancer subtypes that predict prognosis and guide treatment. We need biomarkers still to better define when to escalate or de-escalate therapy and to identify patients with early stage cancer who will benefit from our novel therapies. Biomarkers can be useful in evaluation of symptoms in survivors, but should not be used without, in patients without symptoms outside of a clinical trial. We certainly need more research into biomarkers that can identify high-risk patients um, who can be targeted for early intervention and improved outcomes, um, such as tumor markers in high-risk patients and further exploring the potential of circulating tumor DNA. Biomarkers, as I've shown you, are critical to guide selection of therapy in metastatic disease, and increasingly so. Um, we've got FDA-approved biomarker-driven new drugs, but our, our testing them is now ahead of uh, our routine testing in the clinic, so I'd like to see these things be automated so I don't need to remember to send a PI3 kinase test. Um, it'll be done on all of my patients with ER-positive breast cancer. We're not there yet. Um, biomarkers can be used as one of the tools to evaluate response to therapy, as long as we don't overinterpret them. And liquid biopsies is an early screening of response and guide to precision therapy is clearly the future for those of you who are in pathology or in research. Uh, I would, you know, highly, just from my perspective as a medical oncologist, that's the way the field is moving. Those are the tests I'm most interested in ordering. So I'll leave you with the words of the ASCO guideline panel from 2015. In this era of molecular medicine and patient-centered care, it is critical that the medical community continue to lobby for and conduct high-quality biomarker research for women with advanced breast cancer. And as we've seen, even since those guidelines, we've got new validated biomarkers and new FDA-approved drugs to use, and outcomes and prognosis is getting better. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, bearing with me through this discussion of biomarkers and breast cancer. Thank you, Dr. Peppercorn, for that outstanding presentation. We will now move on to the Q&A portion of the presentation. As a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. Our first question is, Dr. Peppercorn, you have touched base on screening in asymptomatic patients and how using biomarkers might not be as useful. How would you treat patients with high risk of breast cancers? Would you still not choose biomarkers to screen, especially in young patients? It's a, it's a good question and it's a really tough question. Um, mm -hmm. It comes up all the time in clinic um, because we do tell people they're at risk. We give them all these interventions and, and then we worry. Um, and, and I will say this part of managing fear of recurrence, which is not exactly what you asked about, but part of managing that is simply to acknowledge that it's a very real thing that many people experience. Um, and it's normal. Uh, in terms of biomarkers being the answer to that or being the answer to help find things early, uh, the fact is that we just don't have um, evidence yet that screening an asymptomatic patient of any age and of any risk um, leads to any clinical benefit. So we've got clinical validity for the biomarkers, but we don't have clinical utility uh, for the testing to change what you do. And so, so outside, of, um, outside of a clinical trial, 
I'm really not testing biomarkers routinely in somebody without symptoms. Um, but I also have a very low threshold. And frankly, almost all of us have symptoms at different times, fatigue, you know, and, and usually I'm not suspicious, depending on the symptom, that cancer is the answer. But it's reasonable to check biomarkers if there's something going on. And, and I think you have to do it, particularly for your high risk patients at a lower threshold than you would for a very low risk patient. So that tends to be how I use them in practice. Um, and that's consistent with the guidelines. Um, but I guess I would also just want to add that we clearly need better studies and research looking at these high risk groups, you know, young patients for sure, positive lymph nodes, the subtypes that I mentioned that are, that are more dangerous um, to see if screening, bio, screening for biomarkers um, in asymptomatic patients can lead to early diagnosis and can lead to improving the cure rate. It's possible that it could. It really hasn't been clearly established one way or the other. Okay, thank you. Our last question here is, what are your thoughts about imaging versus using biomarkers in breast cancer screening and monitoring? Uh, I think we're probably talking about metastatic patients there. Um, and clearly, you need to image. It's absolutely standard practice. You're going to get scans anywhere from uh, every two to four months initially, every three to four months down the road, and sometimes if someone's doing well for a long time, six months. Um, so the question is really how do biomarkers fall in as an adjunct to that, and what you know is, is either one of them the gold standard? Um, I guess I would say that I use that stool, as I described, I'm always much more frequently than imaging, asking patients how things are going. And if they, things do not seem to be going well, I may get the scan earlier, and I, I will be getting biomarkers. Um, now, not all patients with metastatic breast cancer have elevated CEA and CA2729 or CA15-3. And if I test at baseline and they're not elevated, even though they have disease, then we, we don't use them. But if they are elevated, um, they're often a very useful tool I use them in addition. One thing to highlight is, especially with immunotherapies now, you can have a scan that actually looks worse because it's the immune response to the tumor. So it's it's sort of a pseudo progression um, where it looks a little bigger on scans, but it actually reflects a favorable response to treatment. It will lead to a good outcome. And this is where biomarkers in particular can be very useful to figure out what's going on in the cancer. So we try not to use any one tool in that stool alone. We use them all in combination. Thank you again, Dr. Jeffrey Peppercorn, and thank you to the audience for your outstanding questions. We hope you found today's presentation to be informative and insightful. This presentation will be available for on-demand viewing. Don't miss out on our other valuable presentations on our agenda. Visit the Agenda tab in the auditorium for a full listing. Thank you again for your participation. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>